Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matthew Weber. I'm joined by Tyler Kelly. How you doing? Doing good. Alright, so this is the Linux Cast. We talk about Linux, oddly enough. It's in the title. Uh, so, what have you been doing this week in Linux, Tyler? Well, this week has been a testing the Quadro uh, before I leave it sort of week. Um, I ordered a card. I ordered a 280, uh, R9 280, um, and the seller backed out, which that was awesome because I got it at too good of a deal. I think they realized that they were selling it for way too, way too low. Um, but now I got a 7950 on the way, and so I've just been testing out my Quadro just seeing what it can handle and what it can't and it's it's oddly surprised me the stuff that it can handle like left for dead i can play at some pretty decent settings as long as it's 720p you know i can play it pretty good and for how low end of a card it is and it being a quadro um it's it's surprised me just what it can do yeah i i honestly never actually heard of the 7950 that when did that come out uh, I believe 2012, and it still actually performs w way better than the K4000 does. Uh, I'm pretty excited to get it because I'll be able to play almost any game I want, 1080p, medium settings. So, Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, and I got it for $75. So oh, cool. in that's... this graphics card market, steal of a deal. Yeah, I just saw, I, the one I'm looking at right now on eBay that I just showed on camera is, the, is 110 on eBay. Mm -hmm. So you, it looks like you did get a pretty good deal. Uh, so I've been, so I did, actually the video that I will post today on the channel is all about X monad. So that's what I've been dealing with the last two weeks. This is the last I'll be talking about it. Um, <laughs> let's just say that I'm done with X monad and you should watch the video that I post today. Cause I went on for about good 20 minutes, just ranting about it. So it's, it's good. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing, is um looking more awesome window manager that's the next one i'm going to be installing and playing around with so we're going to be giving that a try uh i did a stream on it it was actually i think it was my first stream that i did on awesome window manager and i wasn't impressed with lua so i uh, i'm interested to give that an, a you know a, a better longer term try so that's basically what i've been doing honestly most of my time this week has been spent messing around with Caden Live because I'm back on Caden Live and the more I use it, the more it's kind of terrible. Yeah. Um, I still haven't given that olive one that you said. I was to, just about to ask that. I haven't done it yet. Uh, someday. I keep forgetting. Well, I, I, I know I know the alpha thing is is a big push, like, yeah. turn, turn away for most people. Um, but if you give it a shot, it is so surprisingly good like man if it was um, just a beta like i can deal with I a beta totally software understand. right but it, alpha software is like this means you just started this yeah. yesterday right i mean yeah. <laughs> like you're you're a high school kid in the basement doing his first programming project and that's what this is right so this scares the <laughs> crap out of me uh, uh, which i totally understand um now before we completely leave Xmo net, I I gotta ask. So you did get Xmo bar working, correct? I did. Yes. Uh, I don't know what I was doing wrong. So what I ended up doing. So, Arco Linux, the the guy who does Arco Linux has uh, like two thousand videos on Arco Linux on his YouTube channel, and one of those is how to switch from Polybar to Xmo bar in Arco Linux using the Arco Linux Xmo Xmo net ISO, which is what I'm using. Okay. And that worked. It was basically just switching out two packages and hitting this. They have like a, a bash script alias called Skell. And basically what that does is take your old configuration file, shove it off into a backup file, and completely re rewrite it. The conf whole config file. Uh, so All I did that. Right. Uh, and it worked. Uh, and I stayed on XMOBAR for uh, three or four hours. <laughs> like, <laughs> a a after that, because I looked at the... I had seen the XMOBAR RC file before... Uh, but because it wasn't working, I didn't like actually go through it, like figure out how mm -hmm. to you know, figure it out and stuff. And once I got mm -hmm. it you know, up and running, I looked at it. I was like, I don't have the patience for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I immediately put my old configuration file back in and started using poly bargains. And, and that's what I was doing for the last, 
I don't know, four or five days, we just use Polybar, and it works. You know, Polybar is great. It, it seems to work fine in X Monad. Uh, honestly, it was the scratch pads thing in X Monad that pushed me over the top and has got me to leave. No, uh, so I don't understand Haskell. Or the <laughs> like, like I know when I post that video, there's going to be somebody in the comments says, "Well, X Monad's great. You're just too stupid to understand it." And I a hundred percent agree with that. <laughs> like, like I do, I, I understand X Monad's perfectly fine. Uh. I don't particularly think that the documentation is as good as everybody think it is because it doesn't seem to apply to every situation. Um, like because there's multiple ways of doing things in Haskell. And if you mm -hmm. do things one certain way, the documentation might not work for you. So mm -hmm. uh, that's my biggest, I'm that's probably my biggest problem because like, I understand the idea that, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know these things, right? But I mm -hmm. want the ability to learn them, and the fact that it seems to be impossible to learn them because of this quirk of the way Haskell works. Um, and it's possible that that's still a misunderstanding on my part. It could be that the documentation works fine, and I'm still just a dumbass. 100% <laughs> possibility of that. Uh, but I just couldn't get past it, so... Um, yeah, yeah, I'm and just, I, and uh, I've had plenty of problems with uh, like with Haskell and learning X Monad. Like that's one of the things I appreciate. Like I know there are people out there that will say exactly what you're saying, but well, I mean, when it comes to something like Qtile, you don't run into those issues. Like you're not gonna set up your config in a different way, where just the documentation for Qtile needs to apply differently or anything it's just you know well, if you need to add a widget that, that that's how you add a widget that and I, all right so there are two window managers out there that have the best documentation ever i3 and qtile those Q, the, the documentation for those is fantastic it's the best you'll ever see i think i3 is slightly better uh, because it's more I'll written agree. for the it's it's written for the every man like it's written in language you can mm -hmm. understand Qtile is much more technical, but you can still understand it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the Xmonad stuff is not only all over the place, but it's uh, it's not well detailed. It just has, like, here, do these things and this, and it'll work. But like, no, it's not, it, it didn't work. You know, it's, it's dumb. It's it, it doesn't make any sense to me, and, you know, whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, but you're right about the, the Qtile thing. I love Qtile, and... Uh, I'm gonna reinstall it on this machine eventually. I, I just um, I have my problems with the workspaces, and somebody's even offered to take my configuration file mm -hmm. and make I saw that <laughs> make it work with more than ten, nine workspaces. So I will eventually get around to doing that. But right now I don't have Qtile installed. Like right now I have Xmonad, DWM, and Awesome. Uh, so. That's one of the things that I do appreciate. Uh, like, I feel like Qtile is the only community where you have people that will, like, not just help you, but, like, somebody will, will literally be like, hey, I will rewrite your config for you just <laughs> yeah. to make something work. Like, yeah. Um, and, and then in Xmonad, you have people that are perfectly willing to explain things to you, but if you don't understand what they're explaining, <laughs> like, I don't understand what you're talking about. You might as well be talking Latin. I don't know any words in Latin. Like, none. Oh, I know, I know one phrase in land. E pluribus unum. Is that the the thing that's on the back of the dollar or whatever? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> like I don't know. That's uh, I know. I know. But a pig Latin. But that's uh, that's just because it's made up words. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Uh, let's move into the the contact information. I did shorten this section up a bit. Uh, it's a work in progress. So you can follow us on Twitter at LinuxCast. Subscribe at the LinuxCast.org. Email linuxcast at gmail.com, patreon, patreon.com slash linuxcast. Thanks to all of our su su supporters. Follow Zany at, on Odyssey. At the official Zany, he's Zany, by the way. He's also Tyler. I, <laughs> I go by multiple names. He has multiple personalities, is what he's got. Uh, you can also follow him on YouTube. The link will be in the video description below or in the, uh, the show notes. Uh, if you're listening to this via audio, you can also subscribe to us on YouTube at the at YouTube at the YouTube uh, at youtube.com slash Linuxcast. This, this is a little bit shorter. Uh, I took out bit. I took out my Twitter. Uh, I took out the Facebook because fuck Facebook. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, literally, I think I have like six likes on Facebook because if you're in the Linux community, you probably don't want to be on Facebook. I'm on Facebook and um, I'm a part of some groups that I can't 
just leave behind. So that's the reason why I'm still on Facebook. Yeah. Anyways. Um, yeah, I feel like Facebook is one of those platforms where Linux people are like, uh, I don't find my Linux channels there. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. The, they, the thing is, though, if you are on Facebook, there are a few Linux groups that are really good. Um, really? Yeah. Like, um, If you can ignore the rest of the political nonsense that's on Facebook, which is <laughs> the majority of the places, mm-hmm. there are Linux groups out there that are in there that are really good. Um a lot, I mean, really active, lots of helping and stuff like that. It's basically like Reddit, but without the moderation because <laughs> there's no moderation. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure, I'm sure there are mo- is moderation, but it's, they're not like a you know whatever front and center. Yeah. Anyway, so every each and every week, uh, Tyler and I pick a news link, and this week is no exception. So Tyler, what is your news link? My news link is news link. My news link is uh, the new Ubuntu Touch OTA um, that now has NFC support. Um, at, at least they're testing it. As far as I know, it's not um, you know it's not just flat out NFC just works on every device. Um, I think they're still it's still in the testing phase. Um, but that being said, I think this highlights um, an interesting topic that there could be some pretty cool like features that you just don't expect for Linux phones to have. Like NFC is just something I hadn't thought of like coming to a Linux phone. It, it was like e- even though to this day I don't I mean I, I use NFC for some things like you know maybe the odd timeout that i actually like use nfc to swipe a card at a at a gas station or something but you know i don't really use nfc that much at all mm. but interesting feature i just didn't think would make it to a to a linux phone especially soon it right. just hadn't crossed my mind that's my question is that it's weird that they're worried about adding new features when they I'd worry about making it fast first, you know, <laughs> uh, focus on performance Agreed. first and then slowly add in features that you need. Now I understand NFC pro- is probably one of those things that a lot of people request, but I'll be a hundred percent honest with you. I don't think I've ever used NFC, not, not a single time. Um, so you've never used like, um, like, um, what is it called? Google pay or whatever? No, no. You actually have to have money in order to use Google <laughs> pay. So, uh, and, and, uh, I just, I use cash. I mean, it's just, and I mean, just mm-hmm. only just recently did I get a, like a savings account again because I, for years I just didn't want money in the bank or mm-hmm. have money in the bank. You gotta remember, you, you go to college, the college takes all of your money. <laughs> yep, yep. So, uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's just been recently that I've actually had disposable income again. So, um, mm-hmm. no, I've never used Google Pay. And I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to. Uh, it's, um, it, it feels like, like it's like an added layer that I don't really need. Because, like, my card or whatever has tap to pay on it. So mm-hmm. it's not going to be adding any extra thing. And it's not as if I'm going to go out of the house without my wallet. So I'm going to have my credit card with me. Um, it, Cause you can't, I mean, you have to have your wallet. You have to have your ID on you. So you can't yeah. just have a copy of your, ID. excuse me, offer. I don't have my ID on me, but I have a picture of it. Yeah. You know, that's going to work really well. So, I mean, it's not yeah. as if, like I said, I'm going to have my card with me anyway. So why do I have to set up this extra thing? That's also going to have all of my social security information and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah, the way I use it, I, I have my ID. Like, I'm probably the the weird person here, but so as far as I know it, the credit cards add added tap to pay to kill you know Google Pay and Apple Pay, um, so that you know they could still compete. Um, that being said, I hopped on Google Pay when it was like new new thing where you could the gas station near me was just like it had been updated and had a refresh so they actually had them so i mm-hmm. i used it i jumped on early um but i i understand that almost no one does and it's also not a um secure way of using your card right. at all well all right so i think i so i went i was in mcdonald the line Mc, drive through at mcdonald's like a, a couple weeks ago um and i think for the first time i saw somebody use google or apple pay like in front of me they handed the guy their phone like yeah. First of all, okay. Um, let's just talk about this thing. This thing cost me a thousand dollars. I'm gonna hand this to the guy making minimum wage at McDonald's. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Who is also prone to dropping change. <laughs> right, right. He can't even <laughs> hand me my pennies without dropping them on the ground. <laughs> you want me to hand him a thousand dollar phone? Are you out of your fucking mind? No, it's not <laughs> going to happen. Um, now, I understand supposedly uh, they're supposed to like put the machine out the window and have you tap and stuff like that. So, but that's not the way this happened. Th- this this person actually handed them their phone and he did the mm-hmm. tapping. Like, first of all, you have to have your phone unlocked to do that. Okay. Yes, you do. So that means you're handing them your authenticated phone that has all of your data on it. Now, granted, they're not going to be holding onto that phone for a long time, but these things have NFC on them. What if they have a scanner in their pocket? They just swipe and have all your data. Um, mm-hmm. So, no. Uh, that's um, I, Now, like I said, I understand that's not how it's supposed to work, but it still freaks me the fuck out quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I, it's not something that I like to think about because it's you know really freaking scary, but... Mm-hmm. On your phone, you have Bitwarden. <laughs> it has all of your <laughs> your passwords and stuff, and it's all authenticated with your fingerprint. So, if they somehow bypass that, they have everything. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and well, I mean, if they stole everything I add, it's not that big a deal because I don't have that much to steal. There's obviously they could steal from much more lucrative people, but it's still kind of you know. I'm in the same boat, right? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's just weird. Um, and I, I mean, we we kind of meandered from the subject again <laughs> uh, but the the whole ubuntu touch thing i'm still i'm not there on linux on mobile yet um and we talked about this last week this is it, yep. it's moving way too slow and uh, obviously they have to move slow because there's like five people working on it uh mm-hmm. i'm sure there's more people than that but i mean it's it might but, as well be five people compared to the know. ninety thousand people that you know apple has you know mm-hmm. uh they uh you know it's just a small team so that, so they have to move slow, but it's in a in the marketplace where this stuff moves. You know, Apple releases a new iPhone every single year, and Google has a new Pixel, and all these things. They just move, move, and move, and move. Uh, it can't move this slow. It, it's yeah. just never gonna be okay. Um, it, it'd be nice if they could figure out how to get the community more interested in it. So, because yeah. there are devel- I mean, there are millions of developers in the Linux ecosystem. If they could get some mm-hmm. more of those people to focus on. Uh, you know, developing this thing. I think the biggest issue is that nobody agrees what the operating system should be. So we have yeah. the same thing we had in the Linux desktop. We have, you know, Ubuntu and we have Plasma and we have, you know, uh, you know, five different desktop environments and distributions and stuff. And uh, that's just splitting the effort when all those people should be just working on one thing that works. Mm-hmm. Uh, at I least think, until I you... Think what... Get that oh, yeah, one thing on. worked, and then you can split off and be fragmented all you want. But until yeah. it, you know, it works, because mm-hmm. I, I, I think what a lot of people appreciate about Linux on the desktop having having choice, w- whether you whether you think it's beneficial to have so much choice or not, it's not necessarily a all around bad thing to have choice on the desktop. But that straight up kills Linux on the phone, because. No one, like, no one really, when it comes to Android or iOS, cares too much about the customizability of the phone or how it looks. Might care a little bit between the differences between the two, but it's not that big of a deal. On Android, like, whether your phone's running Plasma or Gnome really doesn't matter because all you want is the apps. Like, that's it. Yeah, apps are all that matters, and performance obviously has to be you know, fast enough. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that, and I'm obviously the camera. I mean, the, uh, that's the thing is that they're not even thinking right now about the camera. Right. And it, yeah. And that has and to be good. Most people nowadays are like photographers with their phones. So yeah, yeah. You, you need it. <laughs> right. I and mean, you don't want a crappy camera <laughs> on this thing that you carry around. Cause it's the only camera you have. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So in a related note, mine was also related. So, um, Risk Five is ha- going to hand out a thousand Risk Five dev boards to developers in hopes, hoping to get people to more focus on building open source applications for uh, the Risk Five platform. So, if you don't know what Risk Five is, basically, it's an open source standard for creating chips. So, it's um, it's like ARM is a is a Risk Five board, um, and it's based on this standard. Now. Uh, the Risk Five stuff is completely open source, as far as I can understand. Now we got to remember, I'm not a chip designer. I have, I only know what I can read. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, uh, it, it's it is very complex, but it, it's a, uh, 
another effort to get more and more people to develop for these low powered boards like the Raspberry Pi and uh, you know the there's one that starts with an A. Uh, you know there's like a whole bunch of these like uh, small single purpose mostly boards that you you know computers that you can use and that's what risk five is trying to do get more people to focus on developing stuff for that and also improving the performance of the chips so uh the reason why i said this was connected to the phones is because this is something that the phones should do <laughs> like they should just say hey you want to know what here's a here's a thousand or ten thousand of these phones and you're a developer have one of these things develop an app for it you know, we need you to develop for it. Yes, Take sir. it. Like, we can't pay you. Like, we don't have any money. Uh, mm-hmm. But we do have this crap load of phones. <laughs> um, even if the phones weren't like uh, like the Prism or the the whatever the the actual phones are. Like, if they just had, like, a Galaxy mm-hmm. S8 or something like that they bought off from eBay for $40 or whatever. They just had a whole mm-hmm. box of these things. You know, ship those out with the operating systems on there. Yeah. I mean, that would make sense to me. And, uh, you know... I understand that stuff requires resources and stuff, but uh, and it, it just seems like that's something to do. Instead, what they've done is they've had these, like the Pine phone or whatever is the cheapest version. The, the Leap Ring 5 is the other one, right? And that yeah. one was like really freaking expensive. Yeah, right? it was like, like five, six hundred bucks. Yeah, like developers aren't going to do that for an untested platform. Mm-hmm. So at least with the Pine phone, like it's like, you know, it's 200 bucks or whatever. Uh you might get a developer or two that have that kind of money that can just buy it then. But still, mm-hmm. I think you'd be better off saying, you want it? Here's a thousand of these things. You know, mm-hmm. if you want one in your developer, whatever, have at it. Yeah. Uh, it See, I think risk risk five knows what they're doing because the Linux phone market doesn't seem to really understand the fact that the, de- the devs that are going to develop for it anyway, uh, it, it, there's no financial incentive. It, it's not like someone who's going to come over and make an app for one of the, you know, Pine Phone or Librem Five and make a killing. Like that's the financial incentive's not there. So the financial um, loss that they have to take to even develop for the platform makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I and the thing about Risk Five that I I wish more people were talking about is just. I, I think Risk Five has a lot more potential, uh, like future wise, than X eighty six does. Armed, I mean, Arm is essentially Risk Five, just proprietary, you know, implementation mm-hmm. of Risk Five. So, um, like, I mean, I think Risk Five has a has a great future ahead of it, and well, I f- that and feel the, like most likely the yeah. industry knows it too because Risk Five is actually backed by a ton of huge corporations. So like Microsoft and mm-hmm. Google and Amazon, all these places are uh, have invested heavily in into Risk Five. So at least as far as I know, I, mm-hmm. I, I might mis- be mis- misremembering that, but I see, I seem to remember reading that somewhere where they've been uh, uh, backed by some corporations. Um, so. That that's the that's the news. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for like five seconds. So, um, moving on to the main topic. So this is a good one. If you're a new user, what distribution should you use? Should you use Mint or should you use Ubuntu? These are the two di- distributions that are most widely proclaimed to be the new user distros. Um, and most people, I think, are probably going to say Ubuntu because it's the most popular. So I'm very interested to know, Tyler, what your thoughts on which is the best distro for noobs. Um, my take on this probably will be controversial, but so you're, let's say you're a complete new user, Matt. You've, you've never used Linux. You've never touched it in your life. I hand you a copy of Linux Mint. You install it. Like I walk you through it. You install it. No problem. I mean, granted, you could probably install it on your, yourself without a problem, even not using Linux before. But I walk you through it. You have a brand new Linux Mint install and you want to install, let's just say Discord because you use Discord already. It's something you're familiar with. When you go to install it, what are all the tutorials going to um say that you're using to walk you through installing it i'm assuming that there would be something like apt right 
well almost every tutorial that you find Again, will will walk you through ubuntu assuming oh, that you're using okay. ubuntu and the install like the the tutorial it's the same like you know because linux mint is essentially based off of ubuntu your the install is going to be the exactly the same process but as a new user, complete new user, if I wasn't there to talk to you and tell you that, yeah, that's the same thing, that's that's what you need to follow, it's going to be confusing. So mine is always just Ubuntu for the complete new user who knows nothing. Oh, we disagree on something. Yes. It's going to be good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my answer is Mint. So it, uh, this is going to be surprising for anybody who knows me because I don't like Linux Mint at all. <laughs> Like, I can't stand their developers most of the time, uh, and I, I don't really care for uh, the fact that it even exists. I think, personally, I, the last thing we need is another Ubuntu-based distro. We have 12,000 mm -hmm. of them. We don't really need them. Um, that's just my opinion. It's not any something anybody agrees with. Uh, but and after hearing that opinion, I am more interested to hear how you think Linux Mint is better. Okay, but... The thing is, when you are a new user, the thing that you so I got I we got in trouble last week for saying that all old people don't like change. First of all, I'm sorry about that generalization, but uh, if you're so I'm gonna make on that note I'm gonna make another generalization. Uh, <laughs> if you're a new user, you probably don't want something that looks completely different, and uh, if you're going to switch to Linux, you're gonna want something that looks at least somewhat the same and. Ubuntu doesn't offer that. They look... Ubuntu and their weirdness looks nothing like Windows. It has big icons along the side. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's not as if it's unintuitive to use. Um, and my dad seems to be doing just fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're switching, you probably want something that looks like Windows. And Cinnamon looks like Windows. Um, so that's my argument for why I think Mint is better. Now, you do make a good point on the tutorials thing because there's not, I don't, there are Mint tutorials out there. Mm -hmm. Um, there but you're are. right that there are the vast majority of stuff on the internet. If you're looking on how to do something, points, assumes you're using Ubuntu because Ubuntu is so popular. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's disappointing, but that is the way it is. But, I personally think that the mass major so so let's just posit a scenario. For the most part, I think if you're a true Linux new user, you probably didn't install Linux yourself. You probably mm -hmm. had somebody do it for you, or your yeah. computer came with it. Uh, if that's the case, those people probably installed the software that you want for you. So they've installed your browser. You've probably told them you want Discord or whatever. Chances are, I mean, in, in this scenario, that's probably happened for you, or you have somebody that can do it for you. So that means they're not going to be facing the problem that you have posited, you know, because they're not going to, yeah. once their software is on there, the three apps that they use, they're mm -hmm. never going to install another thing in their entire lives. And that's, and that's the way most computer users, again, I'm getting in trouble with generalizations, but chances are most normies, uh, once they have the three or four apps that they use they'll never install anything else on purpose yeah. every once in a while they'll do something yeah. accidentally uh yeah. but they're never going to install anything more so that means that the look and feel and how things actually work is more important than actually how they install software yeah. and they um uh, as well working as well in, as intuitive as Ubuntu is, it's not the same as Windows. Uh, yeah. One of the things that is really different, obviously, is the start menu and the launch menu and stuff, but more it's like the file manager is completely, completely different. Completely different, right? And Nautilus, for those of you who's used Nautilus, I don't understand you. <laughs> like, <laughs> Naut Nautilus is not a good file manager, like, at all. Now, it's better than it used to be. It used to be the slowest thing this side of slow uh mm -hmm. but it's and it's way it's way faster i mean it's just it's super fast now uh, and it's usable for most people uh but it's not 
good. <laughs> and yeah. if if you're comparing it to something like Windows Explorer, which is also not good, I suppose, then those things go <laughs> together. But um, in terms of functionality and stuff, something like Kaha or Thunar or Nemo all have uh, more intuitive interfaces for people who have used Windows Explorer before. Uh, they also have uh, better user interfaces and stuff that are in terms of actually looking like what you know Windows Explorer does. So uh, yeah. file management is a big thing for me because like I tried to switch my mother over to a Linux for the longest time, and the biggest problem for e- either one of these distros is that the file picker is terrible, mm-hmm. and there's no consistency in file picking on Linux at all. So if you're using a GTK app, sometimes you'll get Nautilus, sometimes you'll get some. Thing that you have no clue what it is, but it's a GTK thing. Sometimes, if you're using a cute app, you'll get the the. It's probably like an offshoot or a plugin of Dolphin or whatever. It looks horrible. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's especially if you're not like if you're not like for example, if you use Kden Live on a system that just has GTK stuff installed, the file picker looks like it's from 1998. <laughs> it's horrible, and that's just a system wide problem with Linux. The the File picker would, for whatever reason, is something that they just have, cannot stand, you know, choose a standard on. Now, yeah. personally, as a as a nerd, I would love just to say, you know what? We can't decide on this, so you get to choose what you want the file picker to be. Yes, uh, that'd be so good because you know what? I'm going to choose Ranger. I'm going to choose NNN because that's what I want to do. <laughs> but it'd be so nice to be able to you know, say, you know what? I I only have Thunar on my system. Use Thunar for the pile, file picker. But mm-hmm. they don't do that. No, of course not. That'd be too simple. So I went off into the weeds there, but uh, yeah, I think that Mint is the the, the choice here, and it almost has to be. I mean, I disagree, but uh, like, I mean, it's for a completely different reason. I I think Ubuntu is it's just the easiest, just not not necessarily the easiest, but I think Ubuntu wins in um i don't know the accessibility of installing your own software afterwards because i i don't know i've just found that people even though they rarely ever install software the only times that i've really ever had a problem with somebody using a new linux system is when they go to install something and they follow a tutorial that lays it out ubuntu wise but they are using something different um, and just don't know better. Yeah. I I do agree with you that that use case is not popular. That's not, that's not the majority of people. Um, but that's why I just default to Ubuntu because mm. uh, if you're going to install something and I can't help you at the very least, the tutorial that you find most likely is assuming that you're using it. I think that we're too old to be having this conversation and, in- not in terms of our age, but in terms of the amount of time we've used Linux. Because probably yeah. when we started using Linux, it was very popular and almost necessary. It was almost necessary to go on the internet to find a tutorial to install something. When you wanted to install something, you'd have to go to uh, some website that has a PPA link on it, and you have to add a PPA and stuff like that. That's not the way most people are going to be doing it from now on. Because that was before, really, the ad app store was even a thing. Right, I mean, yeah. GNOME software was around, but nobody used it. it was horrible, uh, and I mean, personally, I still think it's horrible. But whatever, um, you know, most people when they want to install something, if let's just say you're right, and people do install software more than I think they do, they're not going to be going to a t- website to find a PPA. They're not going to know what a PPA is. They're just going to open up the software center and look and see if it's there. If it's not there, they're just going to assume it doesn't exist. Um, yeah. So they're going to go to, you know, Gum Software, search for Discord. They're going to ins- hit the install button because they're used to doing that on their phones. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's how they'll do it. They don't need a tutorial. Yeah. Um, and but, but they might I, not. I hadn't even thought of it, but Flathub. Yeah. It's well, it's now in both. As, as far as I, I don't know about Linux Mint, but I know in Ubuntu, you can just go in there and I think you have to press one button and then you have access to everything that Flathub has. Yeah. So that you don't uh, even have to go somewhere else. Adding in the whole snaps and flat packs thing is going to destroy both of our uh, uh, arguments <laughs> because <laughs> that's just a whole nother mess on top of everything. And it just adds a whole thing c- complexity. But I, I guarantee you, ins- you install Ubuntu on a noob system 
and you tell them to install something, they're not going to have any idea how it works. They're just going to install it. So if flat hubs aren't enabled by default, they'll never know that flat hubs are an option. Uh, they're yeah. just going to install the, whatever they can install. If a piece of software is not there, they're just going to assume that it doesn't exist. Um, and that's just, you know, the way it is. Um, Mint does have a problem. So the biggest hole in my argument for Linux Mint is their app store isn't as good as the Snap store is on Ubuntu. Um, mm -hmm. Because they don't support Snaps out of the box. They support repositories. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not even sure if they support FlatHub out of the box. I'm not sure. I can't even remember. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Whatever their software center is, it's not as good as the Ubuntu one, or at least it wasn't when last time I ch I checked. So it might be that they use the same thing as Ubuntu now, but I know they don't support snaps um, yeah. out of the box. So uh, how again? I don't know whether or not that imp impacts their uh, software availability or whatever. Because really, that's going to be the thing that comes down for you. Because if uh, the software availability is poor, then they're going to be then they're going to be searching for those tutorials online and run into the problem you were talking about. Um, the real <laughs> I just keep coming back to the point. It, it, let's just say I'm right in the fact that they uh, a, a noob will install software from the App Store first, and they can figure that out. They don't need a tutorial. Um, but on Ubuntu, they may never find the software center because it looks completely different than a, uh, than you know Windows. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now it's not really a good argument because the software icon is in the dock by default. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's there. It's not as if it's some hidden thing, but I, your point still stands. It's different. Like the UI is yeah. not like Windows. It's not. It's not something that you're familiar with. I could go ask my dad because he's using Ubuntu right now. He's using the latest release of Ubuntu. I would almost guarantee that he's never opened the app drawer. He may not even know it's there uh, because all he opens up is Chrome. Like I installed Chrome yeah. for him. He opens up his computer, clicks the Chrome icon. And does his puzzles. That's all mm -hmm. he does on his computer. Um, now he's obviously not the most complicated of computer users, uh, but I would guarantee that that's probably the most use uh, that you, most Linux new people will, that aren't nerds uh, will be doing. They're gonna they're gonna want their browser. They're gonna want their email and maybe a chat client. Mm -hmm. I, I say maybe a chat client because probably they don't want a chat client either because they're new. I mean, yeah. But, we also have to consider, because we're, we're taking this in, in, in one way, like, as in a noob is also a Luddite, and I don't think that's a good uh, correlation, because just because, chances are, if you've decided to use Linux, you have a little bit of nerd in you, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to be experimenting on some things. Like, if you've chosen to, like, not, like, like I installed Ubuntu on my dad's computer. He, I, I did that because he hates updates. He doesn't care what he uses. He doesn't even know what Ubuntu is. He knows it's Linux probably, but he doesn't know what... Uh, he'd probably say it wrong. I'm just <laughs> He'd pronounce it wrong. Um, but the, the, the point is, uh, if you've chosen to use Linux, you've chosen to install it on your computer, you probably have some nerd in you because you know how to burn an ISO, you know how to get past UEFI, all of these things. So th the question I have is for that user, the one that has some technical expertise so they're not going to care about being able to go through and find a tutorial if they don't know something so they have some kind of technical expertise which distribution then is going to be the best one between ubuntu and, and mint and my argument then if they have some uh technical know-how i'm going to say uh kde the Kubuntu is actually the the proper <laughs> answer here because um, even though that's not one, there wasn't one of the options. <laughs> I understand yeah. the, the, the thing; it wasn't one of the options. But um, I, GNOME is ugly, and you'll you'll be unhappy with GNOME for a long time. Um, and I, I think Cinnamon is a good like middle ground between GNOME and KDE because it has a lot of KDE's customizability, but also runs on GTK, so things are going to look a little bit better. Yeah. Out of the box, at least. Um, so, Cinnamon might be the best answer for those type of people. Because it gives them the ability to uh, 
you know, customize stuff and tweak stuff and get into the nerdy kind of stuff of stuff. But it's not so technically complicated that like KDE would be. So I guess I've kind of talked myself into Linux Mint being the answer if I had to choose and one. In that scenario of the technical minded person switching over and the choice between Ubuntu and Linux Mint, I mean, I would agree Linux Mint. Um, not just because it's GTK based um, or cinnamon, but it just overall, if you're if you've got more technical know how, I I feel like Linux Mint is just more interesting than Ubuntu because there's a lot of a if you're at all technically minded when you start using Ubuntu, there's just a lot that you yeah you can change, but you know it's clear that gnome's not really i don't know to me gnome is not one of those things that, yeah you can customize it but once you start customizing it a lot you might as well have like done it, something else exactly like it's clear that it's not meant to be customized heavily mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's the biggest problem i have with gnome is that they don't want you to customize it they mm -hmm. like uh, they do have the extensions app now so that's a little bit better but the way you install extension, extensions is still the stupidest thing. And I mean, put those extensions, I mean, you have a store, put the extensions in the store. Don't yeah. put them on some rando website that you have to use Google to find. And then you have to install this stupid extension in your browser in order to do this. That's, that's the dumbest UI design in the history mm -hmm. of UI designs. It just does not work. Um, I mean, it works, but it's dumb. Um, yeah. random, random. And that's, that's a lot of, uh, of my problems with Ubuntu, like me giving Ubuntu to, to not just new users, but you know, new to Linux users, they know what's going on when you start customizing Ubuntu. Um, or, I mean, really pop OS, anything GNOME based, it's, you're, you, it's not necessarily that, cause I mean, the argument that a lot of people on the GNOME side make is, you know, there's the extensions. Yes, it can be customized. It's obviously meant to be customized, but it's so much stuff doesn't work right when you have heavy customizations. So it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't feel right. Well, that, and despite the fact that GNOME hasn't changed all that much in the last 10 years, uh, those extensions break all the time. Because they're always making changes on the bottom. Like, for the longest time, it almost felt like the Gno people who designed GNOME were very against extensions existing at all. Because they deliberately break things. Mm -hmm. um, they deliberately change things so that extensions would break. Now, they seem to have gotten over that once they introduced the extensions app. Uh, but still, things like... Even now, the most popular extension is uh, Dash to Dock, right? And mm -hmm. it won't work in GNOME 40 because they broke it, right? Now, I, I mean, you can understand the reason why it's broken because they've changed the UI now for the first time in forever. But still, that stuff happens all the time. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is me kind of off topic. But if you're coming from Mac and moving on to Linux, really then ent elementary OS kind of enters the conversation a little bit. And I, mm -hmm. I just used elementary OS 6 for the first time. And... It reminded me of everything I dislike about Elementary OS because as much as GNOME hates you customizing things, Elementary OS is a hundred times worse. But granted, yeah. granted, if you're coming from Mac, you're used to it. So uh -huh. uh, you can't customize. Granted, you can customize a Mac a hell of a lot more than you used to be able to customize Elementary OS because they didn't have a dark mode. But that's at least solved. Um mm -hmm. But I mean, just when we were talking about the customizability of GNOME, it made me think, well, you know, if you really want something that's for new users and you don't want them to tweak anything, uh, install Elementor OS because at least at one point you couldn't even install a PPA. Like it, it would give you an error. Like you had yeah. to find a workaround to get the PPA system to even work. I don't know if that's still the case. I have no clue. Uh, I think I, I think you can add PPAs now. I think. I, I, I think I remember them changing that but still at one point <laughs> there was no point in ever even opening a terminal because there was nothing you could do in it mm -hmm. um so uh, and they support flathub out of the box they have a really good uh you know app library and uh the app store or whatever app center uh so for a new user maybe elementary os is is the answer if if you didn't like the first two things if you didn't like ubuntu or mint Maybe Elementary OS is the 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 option for new users because, or at least the non technical user because it's it maybe it doesn't look like Windows, but people pretty much know what a, how Mac works, right? So maybe that's yeah. an option. Uh, 
personally for me, I would prefer the fewer people use Element Trust, the better. Just I, I, I feel like a horrible person saying that because those people work really hard and they have a really, really good ideas. And the dark mode in it is beautiful. And um, granted, it is just the dark mode of Adewaita. I mean, it's yeah, all it is. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> they've made I, I, this. This is like I said, this is horrible to say. Um, but they made such a big deal over this dark mode. Uh, when all they've done really is take the dark mode from another theme to implement. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. there's more technical things that they've done underneath that. They've you know made it system wide. They've gone through and tried to get their apps to look better and had it not be so hacky as actually using a theme. Uh, but <laughs> that being said, they it just it's, it's just another thing. Um, yeah. it's, it's not as if you've scaled the mountain and made Linux the perfect thing ever. It's yeah. just a theme. Calm the fuck down. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. But I, I think that is the elementary, like, mindset is everything they do is it, it's like the the Apple, like, we're or the Apple mindset of we're going to make the design top, the top priority mm -hmm. of the entire thing. So, like, even something that is very simple, like a theme, has to be taken to the most extreme of detail ensuring that it matches everywhere and nothing can look hacky at all which i do appreciate but then also i do agree with you it's not a good thing for um the entirety of linux it, like yeah. that, that's sort of the thing about elementary os if you're inside the the elementary os bubble it's really awesome like it, it, it's great but nothing from that bubble benefits the bigger linux community so it's it's like yeah you're off in your own little bubble of linux you don't really get anything from the bigger linux community and nothing that you do in there like sure elementary os apps work off of elementary os but they i mean you've said this before and i completely agree with it they look like elementary os apps on anything else that you run yeah so you know. it's a thing it's definitely a thing right so um <laughs> i i think We've come to the 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 conclusion that what what you use depends on how much technical know how you have, right? Because um, mm -hmm. maybe you're right. Maybe uh, I do kind of agree with you that uh, Ubuntu is for someone who's completely uh, new to Linux and has no technical know how. Ubuntu is probably the answer, uh, and for the reason you've said, uh, mm -hmm. I still think for the most part that the UI is more important. Um, but maybe the solution then is, hey, Ubuntu, change your freaking UI. <laughs> yeah. your, your UI is really old, bro. It's You need to change this stuff. Adopt Cinnamon or adopt KDE. I, I, personally, I would. I really had wished that when they changed from Unity, they would have chosen KDE because uh, I've always been a KDE fanboy. Um, mm -hmm. But... <sighs> As a, I understand why they chose GNOME because you have a lot of new users come to Ubuntu, and I don't know if you want to have them use KDE. There's just so many places they can get lost. It's like letting mm -hmm. your kid go in the, like, I, going to Sears. You used to go to Sears, <laughs> and these Sears department stores were, you know, the size of like twelve football fields, and they had these little micro stores on the inside. And if you're like a really kid, that's like. Christmas come early because you're gonna get lost in there, Garen fucking teat. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, that's what KDE is, K K except for KDE is still in business. Oh, Ooh, <laughs> too soon. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, you go into KDE, you're gonna get lost because there's just so many settings. I mean, the, the settings app is, alone is like a gigabyte worth of stuff. You know, it's not true, but I mean, it feels like it. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I feel like I, I do agree with you. Ubuntu could do a lot better if they went with KDE and just maybe a they did their own polished version of KDE, like mm -hmm. where they cleaned up some things or I mean, you know did the, something unique. Yeah, the option might be cinnamon because like I don't really care for cinnamon, but cinnamon is like the cinnamon or XFC. I mean, XFC is too uh, outdated in terms of like development stuff. It's too slow in terms of movement, but. Mm -hmm. uh, Cinnamon is not, right? So Cinnamon has a ton yeah. of modern features. It's built on GTK3. You know, it has all this customization and stuff that you can do to it, but it's also very simple. So Cinnamon might be the answer, but on Ubuntu. So, like, there's a, yeah. there's an Ubuntu spin of Cinnamon or whatever. It's like, whatever they call it, Cinnamon Ubuntu. Um, mm -hmm. 
that might be the best place for Ubuntu to go. I don't think that it's ever going to happen. Uh, no. Personally, they're, I think they're on GNOME now forever. Um, and, and that's just... Unfortunately. That, that's just depressing to think about. Um, mm-hmm. Because... All right, so we should make this a topic on another on another show. But what do you think, just real quick, what do you think the chances are of the Ubuntu UI changing to adapt to what GNOME 40 did? Do you think that they're going to adopt any of the GNOME 40 UI elements? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah. like, they might. They might take like the workspace thing where you know that like they we go out the workspace instead instead of the stuff along the side. They might have the vertical one now. They might do that. Um, maybe. Maybe. But I. But it's almost a guarantee that that those icons there along the side. Those things are there to stay forever, and they're never going to change them. Now they might change the icons. Uh, like design wise, but that's doc is going to stay there forever and ever. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm so, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm going to make a video about this, but it's, it's so outdated. Like, come on. Like, yeah. You can be an entrenched, you can be entrenched in a design. That's okay. But mm-hmm. not for 15 years. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it, the, that design has been around since 2011, so it's not been 15 years, but it's, it's been 10 years. But still, 10 years of the same design. Now, they've changed the theme, but even that, even the changing of the theme took them forever to decide to do. Um, mm-hmm. And now we're on Yar- Yaru, which I like Yaru. It's a good yeah. theme. Uh, but I'm going to be sick of Yaru in about 10 minutes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I want about something different. I don't know. This is this is me and my ADD stuff. I want things to change a lot. Like I, I like new mm-hmm. things. I, I like to try new things. So that's completely antithetical to what a new user wants. They want things to look the same all the time. So um, my idea of wanting things to change, you know, a lot is not a great thing. But still, I think that there's a middle ground between me wanting something to change every release and not changing for ten years. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Every long-term release being almost a clone of the last one visually is not... I don't know. I don't see that as progress. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like... A, like They have a grand opportunity. I, I just... A, a grand opportunity when they switched away from, a, from Unity to change things. Like, that was their one shot because things were going to change whether they liked it or not because it's mm-hmm. GNOME and Unity was different. They had that opportunity. Like, everybody knew when they abandoned Unity they were going to make a change. Uh, and they could have made UI changes at that point, and everybody would have bitched about it, like they did with GNOME 2. They would have they would have had a ton of detractors, but that was their opportunity. Mm-hmm. But they chose not to do that. They chose to keep the same, uh, and that has buried them yeah. in that UI for the rest of eternity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and unless they make another similar change to a different desktop environment, I mean, because. That if they do that, then they can make a change again because people yeah. will be expecting it. Now, if they made a change to something significantly different, they'd have so many people up in arms about it. Yeah, uh, which I don't understand. I mean, come on, man, it's yeah. old. You need something. It's new. old. We oh, we definitely we definitely do. Right? But yeah, we, de- we we could definitely go on for an entire podcast oh, about that. Gonna, we will do that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to uh, apps of the week. So, uh, Tyler, what was your app of the week? My app of the week was LSD, not the drug, the fantastic terminal app um, or like program. Most people, I feel like if you, you know, if you're familiar enough with the terminal to know uh, bash aliases and have them set up, you most likely are, are using this. But just for those out there who haven't heard of it or haven't used it before, it is a fantastic way of um, just giving your terminal a little bit more bling when you're LSing around uh, in it. Um, so do you use uh, LSD or LS Deluxe? I don't. I use EXA. Ah, and see, EXA does basically the same thing, but it, um, I, I don't. It's not written in Rust. I maybe it's written in Rust. I actually don't know what EXA is written in, so I can't really say. <laughs> I just know that that's what I use, and it's what I've used for almost a year now. So yeah, I've never actually looked at LSD, but um, I mean, because they said say no to drugs, so I mean, this is a horrible <laughs> name. Like, what are they doing? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's the it's the the only reason I said not the drug is when I went to go um put in the link here, I accidentally closed out of the tab, and so I went and searched on DuckDuckGo, and all it brought up was drug related stuff. And I'm like, no, this is not what I want. Like you don't understand the SEO at all. Whoever did this, <laughs> like you can't name something like that and expect to rank in search results. So um. Yeah, yeah. Word, of, word of mouth is going to be the only way this keeps going. Now, granted, EXA is not any better uh, in terms of naming, but because really naming is freaking hard. Um, mm-hmm. But this looks interesting, and it definitely um, fits the whole mold of everything being transferred to Rust. So yeah, I, I'm not a big, huge like Rust is going to take over the world person. I. I don't know. I I've, I you use Rust apps here and there, but I have. I I don't get the hype around Rust right now. When I want to use an application, I don't use it because it's coded in a certain language. I just want the application to be good. Um, mm-hmm. And frankly, what your LS clone is written in doesn't matter to me as long as it has cool features. Um, yeah, and, and like that's the reason why I can't tell you what EXA is written in. I don't know. I don't care because it mm-hmm. works and it is extensible. And those are the things that I care about. Um, now, that being said, if your LS thing is written in Haskell, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch. I don't. I will not be using your application. <laughs> uh, so um, it only goes so far. Apparently, <laughs> you write it. You can write your That's program awesome. in whatever you want. Just as long as it's not Haskell. I'm I'm going to put that out there. All right. My pick of the week is something f- called Splash CLI. Now, this has been around for ages and ages and ages. Um, but basically, what this is, is a CLI uh, thing that allows you to randomly set a wallpaper from Unsplash. So you can just run this thing, and it will download a fo- photo from Unsplash, set it as your wallpaper. That's literally all it is. Again, I don't know what it's written in. Don't care. Um, no JS apparently is what it's written in. For those of you, you know, who care. Um, but it's a term. Like I said, it's a basically it's just an unsplash terminal client. It doesn't do a ton of stuff. You just run it. It sets a, a random wallpaper. Mm-hmm. That's what um, it does. Can you set it um, like to pick a certain resolution, or are they uh, all downloaded in? I the... b- believe you can go through and do scale yeah you can do scale and you can even select what screen so if you have multiple monitors you can go through and use it uh the dash dash screen uh flag and tell it to set it to a, a certain monitor or set it to both monitors if you want um it'll also there's also one for um there's a flag so if you just wanted to download a random wallpaper without setting it you could just do that um there's, it has quite a few flags. There's like a lot of options and a lot of stuff that you can do here. Like you can uh, do s- different search f- queries. So if you only wanted like the the nature ones, you could go through and do a search query for that. Uh, you could only you could limit it to the search things to just the unsplash featured uh, section. So if you just wanted the the really cool ones or whatever the ones they feature, um, you could also get the photo of the day. That's an option here as well. So uh, there's a t- actually uh, as simplistic as it is, if you just want to use it, there are a ton of options that you can go through and use. Um, so yeah, I've been using it a couple. Uh, I haven't really delved into any of the options. I just run it and have it send me a random wallpaper. Um, and actually, I can can't show you Tyler, but I can show everybody else. Um, this is the wallpaper that I have and I got that from Unsplash. So um yeah. So it's just a random wallpaper thing magic that uses mm-hmm. Unsplash. I I love these neat little programs. Like they I don't know. Like you just don't get these on on Windows. Like I don't I don't know. They they, they exist, but no one really shares them and, and really gives them the attention they deserve. When you use Windows you don't customize anything. Like, yeah, you might set your wallpaper, um, but really that just means you're going to Google Images, finding a wallpaper you want, and click right-click, set as background. That's as mm-hmm. far as your interaction with customizing your computer, for most people, it's probably ever going to go. Now, there's going to be nerds out there that will like, I don't know if you remember this, but back in the <coughs> early 2000s, maybe right around the time Windows XP came out, maybe maybe Windows 7, they had like a star dock thing where you could go through it and give your uh, Windows thing like a, a Mac like dock. 
Um, and that mm-hmm. stuff like that stuff's still around, but I mean, that was the nerd thing to do, right? Yeah, you know, like mm-hmm. I'm customizing Windows to look completely different, and Windows is kind of like GNOME in that way. They don't want you to do that kind of stuff, so <laughs> yeah. it was always very hacky. Um, yeah, so uh, that's definitely something. Uh, like the Windows thing, like on on Linux, you do get a lot of these terminal stuff, and not even just terminal stuff, like these little mini applications, because small time developers can just go through and develop these small applications because they're doing it for fun. When you're developing mm-hmm. for Windows, you're developing for money. Yep. You know, I'm not, not yeah. now that makes all the developers on Windows sound like money grabbing whores, and that's not true, obviously, but um, <laughs> uh, it. it it, it's very different to develop commercially because you have to have a, a viable product that people will want to buy than developing just because you want to develop something you're learning or something. And that, it seems like there's a wider ecosystem stuff for Linux and there's for Windows. Now, that's probably not true. There's probably plenty of this developer stuff going on on Windows, and we just don't know about it because, first of all, we don't use Windows. Second of all, mm-hmm. uh, it's just not something you search for Windows. And you use Windows, you just open up Chrome and use Chrome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, what do you even do on Windows, people? I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, I, I feel like nobody on Windows does anything further than their browsing and then maybe installing a certain piece of software to make a game perform faster. Like, Yeah, it's, it's browsing in it. games. That's which, I mean, that's like the, the stereotype of all stereotypes because you know stuff – other stuff happens on Windows, and you can do pretty much everything on Windows that you want to do. Um, but I don't feel like anybody does those things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just that's the way I feel in my mind. Like there's nothing you can't do anything on Windows because all you're doing is constantly shutting down and rebooting and doing updates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like you now that's definitely a stereotype. All right. Uh, anyways, so that is it for us this week. Coming up next week, I feel like I've already forgotten this. Oh, does Linux need antivirus? That's what we're going to be talking about. Um, I feel like I already know our answers, but we're uh, <laughs> we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, so if you, uh, just make sure if you're interested in contacting us, the LinuxCast.org has all the stuff you need. Uh, make sure you follow Tyler on YouTube. Link in the description below. We'll see you next week. See ya.